Well, it's not often that I come across an article that leaves me so impressed it has me yearning to convert it to audio for the YouTubes. Um, in fact, I don't think that's ever happened. It's probably the first time. Uh, but come across such an article, I have. It's over on the publication called The Atlantic, which almost never has anything the least bit interesting. So it's pretty, I'm pretty surprised that I was, I was so impressed by this stuff. But yeah, the content here is very important, I think. And in an ideal world, all I would have to do is turn the camera on, point to the underbar where the link is, and know for sure that everyone's going to read it. But statistically, I think a tiny percentage of all people who click the video actually click on anything in the underbar. So I'm going to read an excerpt from this article. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's a long fucking article. And um, I'm going to read what I think is the most persuasive part, uh, starting about a couple of paragraphs in. And sort of the contrary argument gets made toward the end, but I think it's all of that is just a product of um, rosy thinking. The part I'm going to read is the persuasive part. So on with the show. The 20th century nature-nurture debate prepared us to think of ourselves as shaped by influences beyond our control. But it left some room, at least in the popular imagination, for the possibility that we could overcome our circumstances or our genes to become the author of our own destiny. The challenge posed by neuroscience is more radical. It describes the brain as a physical system like any other and suggests that we no more will it to operate in a particular way than we will our heart to beat. The contemporary scientific image of human behavior is one of neurons firing, causing other neurons to fire, causing our thoughts and deeds in an unbroken chain that sketches back to our birth and beyond. In principle, we are therefore completely predictable. If we could understand any individual's brain's infrastructure and chemistry well enough, we could, in theory, predict that individual's response to any given stimulus with 100% accuracy. This is just a bit of a foreplay paragraph. Now we're getting to the meat. Um, the research and its implications are not new. What is new, it, um, what is new though, is the spread of free will skepticism beyond the laboratories and into the mainstream. The number of court cases, for example, that use evidence from neuroscience has more than doubled in the past decade, mostly in the context of defendants arguing that their brain made them do it. And many people are absorbing this message in other contexts too, at least judging by the number of books and articles purporting to explain your brain on everything from music to magic. Determinism, to one degree or another, is gaining popular currency. The skeptics are in ascendance. This development raises uncomfortable and increasingly non-theoretical questions. If moral responsibility depends on faith in our own agency, then as belief in determinism spreads, will we become morally irresponsible? And if we increasingly see belief in free will as a delusion, what will happen to all those institutions that are based on it? In 2002, two psychologists had a simple but brilliant idea. Instead of speculating about what might, make, what might happen if people lost their belief in the capacity to choose, they could run an experiment to find out. Kathleen Vo then at the University of Utah and Jonathan Schooler of the University of Pittsburgh asked one group of participants to read a passage arguing the free will was an illusion and another group to read a passage that was neutral on the topic. Then they subjected the members of each group to a variety of temptations and observed their behavior. Would differences in abstract philosophical beliefs influence people's decisions? Yes, indeed. When asked to take a math test with uh, with cheating made easy, the group primed to see free will as illusory proved more likely to take an illicit peek at the answers. When given an opportunity to steal, to take more money than they were due from an envelope of $1 coins, those whose belief in free will had been undermined pilfered more. On a range of measures, Vo told me, she and Schooler found that, quote, people who are induced to believe less in free will are more likely to behave immorally. It seems that when people stop believing they are free agents, they stop seeing themselves as blameworthy for their actions. Consequently, they act less responsibly and give in to their baser instincts. Vo emphasized that this result is not limited to the contrived conditions of a lab experiment. You see the same effects with people who naturally believe more or less in free will, she said. 
In another study, for instance, Vo and colleagues measured the extent to which a group of day laborers believed in free will, then examined their performance on the job by looking at their supervisor's ratings. Those who believed more strongly that they were in control of their own actions showed up on time to work more frequently and were rated by supervisors as more credible. In fact, oh sorry, as more capable. In fact, belief in free will turned out to be a better predictor of job performance than established measures such as self-professed work ethic. Another pioneer of research into the psychology of free will, Roy Bowmeister, and I'm probably butchering this last name as with probably many other last names, uh, Roy, Roy Bowmeister of Florida State University has extended these findings. For example, he and colleagues found that students with a weaker belief in free will were less likely to volunteer their time to help a classmate than were those whose belief in free will was stronger. Likewise, those primed to hold a deterministic view by reading statements like, quote, science has demonstrated that free will is an illusion, were less likely to give money to a homeless person or lend someone a cell phone. Further studies by Baumeister and colleagues have linked a diminished belief in free will to stress, unhappiness, and a lesser commitment to relationships. They found that when subjects were induced to believe that, quote, all human actions follow from past events and ultimately can be understood in terms of the movement of molecules, end quote, those subjects came away with a lower sense of life's meaningfulness. Early this year, other researchers published a sh uh, study showing that a weaker belief in free will correlates with poor academic performance. The list goes on. Believing that free will is an illusion has been shown to make people less creative, more likely to conform, less willing to learn from their mistakes, and less grateful toward one another. In every regard, it seems, when we embrace determinism, we indulge our dark side. Few scholars are comfortable suggesting that people ought to believe an outright lie. Advocating for the perpetuation of untruths would breach their integrity and violate a principle that philosophers have long held dear, the platonic hope that the true and the good go hand in hand. Saul Smilansky, a philosophy professor at the University of Haifa in Israel, has wrestled with this dilemma throughout his career and come to a painful conclusion. Quote, we cannot afford for people to internalize the truth, end quote, about free will. Smolansky is convinced that free will does not exist in the traditional sense and that it would be very bad if most people realize this. Imagine, he told me, that I'm deliberating whether to do my duty, such as to parachute into enemy territory or something more mundane, like to risk my job by reporting on some wrongdoing. If everyone accepts that there is no free will, then I'll know that people will say, quote, whatever he did, he had no choice. We can't blame him. So I know I'm not going to be condemned for taking the selfish option. This, he believes, is very dangerous for society and, quote, the more people accept the determinist picture, the worse things will get. Determinism not only undermines blame, Smilansky argues, it also undermines praise. Imagine I do risk my life by jumping into an enemy territory to perform a daring mission. Afterward, people will say that I had no choice, that my fears were merely, in Smilansky's phrase, quote, an unfolding of the given, and therefore hardly praiseworthy. And just as undermining blame would remove an obstacle to acting wickedly, so undermining praise would remove an incentive to do good. Our heroes would seem less inspiring, he argues, our achievements less noteworthy, and soon we would sink into decadence and despondency. Smolansky advocates a view he calls illusionism, the belief that free will is indeed an illusion, but one that society must defend. The idea of determinism and the facts supporting it must be kept confined within the ivory tower. Only the initiated, behind those walls, should dare to, as he put it to me, quote, look the dark truth in the face. Smolansky says he realizes that there is something drastic, even terrible, about this idea. But if the choice between the true and the good, sorry, but if the choice is between the true and the good, then for the sake of society, the true must go. When people stop believing they are free agents, they stop seeing themselves as blameworthy for their actions. Smolansky's arguments may sound odd at first, given the contention that the world is devoid of free will. If we are not really deciding anything, who cares what information is let loose? But new information, of course, is a sensory input like any other. It can change our behavior, even if we are not the conscious agents of that change. If the language of cause and effect in the language of cause and effect, a belief in free will may not inspire us to make the best of ourselves, but it does stimulate us to do so. 
Illusionism is a minority position among academic philosophers, most of whom still hope that the good and the true can be reconciled. But it represents an ancient strand of thought among intellectual elites. Nietzsche called free will, quote, a theologian's artifice that permits us to judge and punish. And many thinkers have believed, as Smolansky does, that institutions of judgment and punishment are necessary if we are to avoid a fall into barbarism. Smolansky is not advocating policies of Orwellian thought control. Luckily, he argues, we don't need them. Belief in free will comes naturally to us. Scientists and commentators merely need to exercise some self-restraint instead of gleefully disabusing people of the institutions that undergird all they hold dear. Most scientists, quote, don't realize what effect these ideas can have, Smolansky told me. Promoting determinism is complacent and dangerous. Yet not all scholars argue publicly against free will, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so then it gets into the optimism that um, Harris peddles for the most part. Uh, and Harris has a lot of good things to say about a lot of subjects, but he is very optimistic when it comes to this. Um, in his... 2012 free will book he pretty much said that this could do wonders for human psychology if grasped properly but of course if every scientific social experiment suggests that people are not grasping it the way it ought to be grasped then at what point are you going to pull the plug and start concealing truth as illusionism advocates uh, we've had decades of social experiments and all of them have pointed to one direction it has negative impact on social behavior, moral behavior, um, reciprocity, however you want to put it. Uh, there's just something about the human animal, the human psychology, that views uh, traditional, conventional notions of free will as non-negotiable. And I can't identify that spot in my psychology. I'm pretty damn sure that the average person watching this video can't identify it in their psychology. But nonetheless, we're not the average people because, well, we're on the internet making videos and arguing in comment sections, which most people don't do. Uh, and if they do, they argue about well, whatever, political topicality or some other cliche nonsense. Um, so from, from, that, from that standpoint, um, at some point, you just gotta, you just gotta surrender, you just gotta surrender truth and in, in, embrace to an extent on this subject, intellectual dishonesty. Of course, not within the academy, not within, as they say, the ivory tower, right? But when you're talking to the average person who is, as, as, the older I get, I just start viewing them as overgrown children who need to be approached in a specific way um, because approaching them like you would approach your equal um, is just, it's just, at some point, it just becomes a brick wall. That brick wall effect cannot be torn down. Um, so I want feedback. I want people to tell me if this is something they view as non-negotiable or if yeah if it's fully negotiable notions of truth within the context of determinism free will and just just how just how much we should proselytize the truth in this one uh, on this one subject um, I guess I need to point out that the last video um, I said I was going to do a follow-up this big blowout video with the statistics on the prostitution subject or the the decrim subject uh, I scrapped that video because what I ended up doing was just taking screenshots and pretty much reading out what the studies say and it was just a huge pain in the ass to put together and edit so instead of doing up a video on it I just updated the underbar of the original uh, fiscal futurism versus abolitionism video and uh, initially I only had three studies in that underbar and now I have I think almost a dozen so I supplemented that underbar with numerous studies and if somebody sees any issues with those studies by all means we can uh, we can take it from there but at this point I don't see the point of doing an additional video I know I promised I would to the few people who I argued with in the comment sections but I am officially going back on that because I think the studies themselves are a slam dunk and if anyone thinks otherwise, by all means, challenge the studies, point out where they're wrong, and then we can take it from there. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Um, let me know what you think about this, uh, these social experiments, though. I think they're, it's, it's a trend. And there's nothing indicating that the trend is going to start being reversed. And to the extent that it's not going to be reversed, 
what's the responsible thing to do? To pretend, to hold out hope that intellectual honesty must be preserved because at some point in the future, the trend will start being reversed and people would view um, free will the way they, the, the way they ideally should, the, the illusion of free will, the way they ideally should as a non-factor or even as a, as a, as a psychological benefit. Um, I've never actually viewed it as a psychological benefit, just, just personally speaking. I've always viewed the absence of free will um, moment to moment as it just doesn't even creep into my decisional procedure on that moment to moment basis. Um, I guess that says something about how impulsive my decisional procedure is, but uh, that's probably a topic for another video. Um, I'm just trying to think back. When have I ever done something differently because I knew I didn't technically have free will. I can't think of a single example. So for me, and, and I think for a lot of people, it's, it's neither a benefit nor a harm. The existence or the absence of free will. It's forgotten about from on, on the everyday moment to moment mm, behavior or, or even, even, even attitudinal disposition. The only thing it really impacts is it shows just how preposterous on a moral and intellectual level, it shows how preposterous retributivism is and, and backward looking ethics in general. Um, the idea that it can ever be moral to do something that benefits absolutely no one for backward looking reasons. That's about all it does.